year now. And uh, our first guest, when he finally sent us our letter uh, and had agreed to perform with another special guest, uh, he put in the letter at the very end, he said, my brother and I will give you a performance that the spa members will never forget. And then he said, in light of last year's performance, <laughs> let me say it's one that they will love instead. The Jerry Adler Show, with his very, very, very special guest, his brother Larry. Sunset. Thank you. 
you very, very much. Uh, the next song that I'm going to do, I'm using a kind of a musical contest. Uh, I'm going to play a song that everyone in the audience knows. However, I'm going to play the verse before I play the chorus. Now, I know there are some of you guys out there who do know it, uh, but there are those of you who do. Please don't give it away. Let's see if you can have some fun with it and see if you can guess the name of this song. in my career. Tonight is the first night that everyone guessed Melancholy Baby. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Uh, now I'd like to do a medley of songs written by a gentleman who wrote a very special kind of American music. And no one has ever been able to duplicate it. 
So here, no, it's not Gershwin. Here is a medley of songs made famous by, who he also performed the songs as well as wrote them, the music of Mr. George M. Cohan. And if you feel like singing along, be my guest. You always have been. Incidentally, I have not worked the, a show for Spa in 14 years, 1981, which only proves something very important. When you're a hit, they want you back. <laughs> Second Hungarian Rhapsody. And if you know the words, please sing along. <laughs>
keep drinking so much water. I had a two hour rehearsal today. My lips swelled up. <laughs> now, we were supposed to have um, another act with us besides my brother Larry. Unfortunately, he had to cancel at the last, not my brother, but unfortunately, this other gentleman had to cancel at the last minute. A perfectly super uh, tap dancer. And we don't want any of you to feel cheated. So, no, I'm not gonna dance. <laughs> As a result, I would like to give you my impression of what he would have done had he been here. that particular number I just did. And one turned to the other and said, I know how he does that. And the other one said, how does he do it? She said, he does it with his plates. <laughs> I wanted to throw it overboard. <laughs> um, there was a, something written uh, fairly recently that, a number of years ago, but I consider it fairly recently, I had the great pleasure of doing it for the soundtrack of a motion picture that was one of the most violent pictures ever made, but it was extremely marvelous. It was called The Deer Hunter. And from this film came a melody that was so hauntingly beautiful, it became a favorite of mine, and I hope it will come, become a favorite of yours. And it's called simply, Cavatina.
George Gershwin was my idol ever since I can recall thinking seriously about music. And he wrote something that was very upbeat and it has been a personal uh, favorite of mine. And I'd like to do it for you now. And it's called Fascinating Rhythm. A one, two, a one, two, three. said the following. She said, you know, Mr. Adler, I wonder if you realize that practically everything in your repertoire has something to do with either ethnic or religion, or religion in some way. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, think about the numbers that you do. You do the Hungarian Rhapsody for the Hungarians. You do Malaganya for the Spanish. You do Fiddler on the Roof for the Jews. And she went on and on. And it never occurred to me that she was really quite right. I've just added one more to the list. I've just done fascinating rhythm for the Catholics. So, <laughs> oh, come on, it was a joke, for God's sake. Don't write letters. <laughs> How about bingo? How about bingo? I, I had a dear friend in our business in Hollywood, and she was a very close dear friend. And I miss her still. She was such a super, superstar. And I'd like to dedicate this next medley of songs, made famous by the late Judy Garland. Three.
you're just a terrific audience. You're great. Um, you know, people have asked me, what has happened to all of the legitimate harmonica players uh, in, in, in the world? And unfortunately, there are just a few of us left. We're be becoming an endangered species. I mean, there's still my brother Larry, there's, there's uh, uh, Stan Harper, and there's Blackie Shackner, and, and Alan Shackner, and I can go on and on. Uh, and, and it's a shame that we, we, we really are dying off. A very good friend of mine, a marvelous harmonica player from France, just recently met a very strange but untimely death. He decided he wanted to climb to the top of the Eiffel Tower and play over the rainbow. <laughs> Don't ask me why he wanted to do it, but he did. He did one, so he climbed to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Now, this was his favorite song, so he started. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to play it very, very fast. But he played it in the same tempo that I just played it. <laughs> Completely forgot the middle of the song. And his favorite song, again he did. And again he forgot. Unfortunately, he had a violent temper. And in a fit of rage, he took his harmonica, threw it over the side of the Eiffel Tower, and in so doing, lost his balance, went over the side, and hit the deck. 30 seconds later, an ambulance came around the corner. about 250 years ago. No one seems to know who wrote it, but everyone seems to know the melody. And I'd like to do it for you now. It's called The Kerry Dancer.
nice to know. Um, now I'm going to make an announcement about a song that is confusing. And I know it's going to, in advance that it's going to be confusing, but you have to bear with me. There are songs that have been written that, that have an introduction to the song that you're familiar with that really don't have anything to do with the song itself. Um, but the people think that it's part of the song when it really isn't. I mean, do I sound confusing? Of course. Here, I'll give you an example. I will have the band play an introduction to a song, and you tell me what the song is. Gentlemen. Oh, one, two, three, four. business. Now, if you folks don't stop asking for it, we're just going to go right on playing it. Gentlemen, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Chicago. Theater in New York 
and headlining the bill was a gentleman who was considered in those times to be the greatest entertainer of all time. And they say it about him still. And I'd like to tribute, pay tribute to this gentleman by paying, playing a medley of the songs that he made famous. Ladies and gentlemen, the music of Al Jolson. Three, four.
I would like to close my portion of the show by playing something that you're all familiar with, and I hope I have enough breath to do it. But here goes nothing. It's sugar blues.
Le bien Miranda le bien Miranda le bien You must have heard so many artists. In fact, I heard my brother just a few minutes ago tell you what a wonderful audience you are and how marvelous it is to be here. All that cliched crap. <laughs> <laughs> However, once in a while, the cliche is true. You see, I don't know if I can make this clear to you or not, but all my life I've wanted to play Romulus. <laughs> about eight years ago with Schulte in Chicago at August Hall. The notices were extremely good, and I took it to Harry Zelzer, the manager, and I said, look at these notices. He said, they're great, Larry. I said, Romulus? He said, take it easy, kid. <laughs> You're doing well. We have our eye on you. Well, that rather depressed me, and I didn't say anything for a long time after that. But then this record of mine, the Gershwin Group, Oh, I promised I wouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, if there's anything I hate, it's performers who plug their own records. I think it's in such bad taste. And if I do it, it's purely altruistic. <laughs> you see, all of the royalties go to the most advanced mouth organ player of the year. <laughs> I've only found one. <laughs> Now, when the record came out, it got very good notice, and I went to my New York manager, and I showed him the notice, he said, Larry, I'm proud of you. I said, Romulus? He said, don't rush things. <laughs> he said, Larry, you're a pro. You've been in this business for years. You cannot expect to play Romulus just like that. <laughs> You've got to build up to it. He said, look at Arthur Rubinstein. He's 92 years old. He's never played on it. <laughs> so it's awfully nice to know that at the age of 81, I've made it. <laughs> On my 80th birthday, I had a wire from Henny Youngman. Is Larry today or 80 years old? And you look it. <laughs> the number that I'm going to play now, I played in Australia two months ago. I've never played it before, although I've always loved it. It's Best You Is My Woman Now. And without exaggeration, I think this melody deserves comparison with the Liebestart of Wagner. It is that strong and powerful a melody. I've never played it in the way that I'm going to do it tonight because I'm going to accompany myself at the piano. Well, it saves money. <laughs> <laughs>
sure I don't have to tell you that the first three numbers I played were all by George and Ira Gershwin. People have asked me, why did I choose to make an entire record of Gershwin and sometimes do an entire evening of Gershwin? I think it's because to me he is the quintessential composer of the 20th century. Now I have worked and known all of the great composers, Jerome Kern, Cole Porter, Harold Arlen, Frank Lesser. Oh, Frank Lesser's wife, Lynn, was known as the evil of two lessers. <laughs> But of all of those great men, and of course they were great, only Gershwin was able to write in the larger forms, such as Rattay in Blue, American in Paris, Three Piano Preludes, and this magnificent achievement of Paul Gilbert, which I heard in Milan, and it got a 17 minute standing ovation from the Italians. I noticed that that really takes doing. My, my, my brother played fascinating rhythm. You know, Papa Gershwin always called that song Fashion on the River. And Papa Gershwin never quite lost his Yiddish accent. And once he was picked up for speeding on a motorway, and the policeman started to write out a ticket, and Papa Gershwin said, Young men, I'll have you know, my son is Judge Gershwin. He said, Oh, I didn't realize your son was a judge. <laughs> And Ira told me that they once were auditioning girls for a show, and they wanted to see whether one of the girls that were, who were going to sing could read music. So they gave her the Indian love call, and George sat at the piano, and she sang, When I'm calling you, double O, double O. <laughs> came out and saying, you say either and I say either. <laughs> she didn't get it either. <laughs> I don't know what made me think of this. I, I do a kind of Freudian free association act. I suppose with my last name it should be Adlerian. But <laughs> that's as classy a joke as you're going to get all even. <laughs> But I, Andrew Lloyd Webber said to Alan J. Lerner, why is it that people seem to dislike me on sight? And Lerner said, saves time. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to gauge your intellectual level. <laughs> I'll try this out on you. If this works, then I'll, I'll know a little bit better where I stand. A man goes into a confessional in a Catholic church and says, Father, my name is Sam Rappaport. I'm 87 years old. Last night, I picked up a girl, we went back to her place, and Father, remember, 87, we made love like in my life I never made love. And the priest said, just a moment, aren't you a Jew? He says, got it in one, give the man a cigar. <laughs> They said, well, shouldn't you be talking to a rabbi? Why are you telling me? He says, I'm telling everybody. <laughs> yes, now I think I'm beginning to get your love. I'm going to play a number now. I haven't played it for years. It was recommended to me, by the way, by Yasha Heifetz, incidentally. When I wrote my first autobiography, I called it, It Ain't Necessarily So, and my brother wrote to me, and he said, since you're using a Gershwin tune anyway, why don't you call it The Man I Love, an autobiography? <laughs> <laughs> he knows me. <laughs> this is by the gypsy violinist Dinicu, and it's the Horace Staccato. <laughs> Thank you.
It's kind of very good. There, there wasn't room on the stage to put the band. We've got them in the back. <laughs> oh, I have to look at this piece of paper because it has my program. See, I, I made a special program for tonight. And also, this paper has ordered all of my spontaneous ad libs. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, I see. There, there was this superb guitar concerto by Joaquin Rodrigo called the Concierto de Aranjuez. And the middle movement, I think it's been done by Miles Davis, by James Galway, and I think it suits the mouth over very well. So here's the middle movement of the guitar concerto.
now that we know where we stand in the joke section, I, know, I now know the story, the perfect one to tell you. A Japanese comes home and he says to his wife, honorable wife, prepare my harakiri kimono, my harakiri sword, I'm going to kill myself. She says, honorable husband, why would you say such a dreadful thing to honorable wife? He says, honorable wife, I have received word from an unimpeachable source, you have two lovers, a black man and a Jew. She says, honorable husband, oh, you face me. That honky mother love has been shooting you that booboo, my <laughs> Over, I'll have you down pat. <laughs> here, here is one I don't think I ever get tired of playing. I played it in a film called Music for Millions. It's Claire de Lune. And while I played it, June Allison and Margaret O'Brien were supposed to cry. And because June Allison's husband was overseas, that was the reason for the tears. But June Al uh, Margaret O'Brien said to the director, Henry Coster, Uncle Henry, when Uncle Larry plays Claire de Lune and I cry, do you want the steer to these tears to stop halfway down my cheeks, or shall I let them run all the way down? <laughs> she was nine. <laughs> Pleasure.
story, and I want to apologize in advance because it's clean. And it's not all that funny either. But I haven't heard it for a long time, and I'm dying to hear it again. A phone rings, and the little kid answers the phone. He says, hello? The man says, is your daddy at home? He says, yes. May I speak to him, please? No. Why not? He's busy. Well, is your mummy at home? Yes. May I speak to your mummy? No. Why not? She's busy. Well, who else is in the house that I can't speak to? Who else is there? Well, my nanny is here, and there are two policemen, but you can't speak to them because they're all busy. What are they all busy doing? He said, looking for me. <laughs> nice one about a man seeing a girl on the beach with a dog and he figures the dog will give him an excuse to chat her up so he goes over and he says does your dog bite she says no so he puts out his hand to pat the dog and the dog takes a whack of flesh out of his hand and the man said i thought you said your dog didn't bite she said that's not my dog <laughs> authentic geniuses that I've met in my life is the great jazz guitarist Django Reinhardt. I heard him with the French Hot Club in a concert in Paris in 1938. And I called Columbia the next day and said, I've got to record with these men. They are wonderful. And we recorded four sides together. So here is one of the sides that I did with Django. I got rid of them. recorded it today because there isn't another Django around to inspire me. Well, when you work with a musician like that, see, I'm not a natural jazz player, but when I work with people like Django or Bill Evans or Dizzy Gillespie, it makes you play over your own head because you're working with such marvelous people. Dizzy came to see my show in Chicago, and after the show he said, you want to smoke some, Larry? I've never smoked pot in my life. But you know, if Dizzy asks you, you're not going to say no. So we went up to my hotel room, he filled the pipe, handed it to me, lit it, but he didn't tell me how to smoke it. And I puffed away, and in 20 minutes, had I to do another show, I could not have done it. And that was my first and last experience with pot. But my God, what a musician Dizzy Gillespie was. I mean, he had a technique 
could, I think, could be favorably compared to Yasha Heifetz on the violin. And it, it's just awful to think that such people are no longer around. And who's taking their place? I can't think of anyone. I'm going to go back to this thing. Oh, I, oh, I thought of a story I can tell you meanwhile. This is about a Jew and a Chinese who played gin rummy every Saturday in Hong Kong. And the Jew said to the Chinese, I want, I want to ask you something. I know that you're a good 20 years older than I am, and you look at least 15 years younger. What is it, your religion, your philosophy, what? And the Chinese said, Sam, if you hadn't brought it up, I never would have mentioned it, but of course, I'm a Buddhist. And we Buddhists do everything in moderation. For example, when I make love to my wife, I begin to caress her in bed. After a while, I stop. I go to the kitchen and I brew some rice wine. We sip the wine, we put the glasses aside, I begin to caress her again, I stop. I get a book, The Analects of Confucius, and I read there. I put the book aside and then and only then do we proceed to the true natural climax of lovemaking. And the Jew said, that's fantastic. And that night he begins to caress his wife in bed, which he hasn't done for 19 years. <laughs> After a while he stops. He goes to the kitchen and makes Russian tea in a glass with lemon. <laughs> they sip the tea. They put the tea aside, he begins to caress her again, he stops. He gets the Jewish daily forward. <laughs> he reads her an account of a week in the Knesset <laughs> in Hebrew. He begins to caress her again and she says, Say what's come over you, you're screwing like a Chinaman. <laughs> first. <laughs> Here, here's one I've been playing for a long time. By the way, we're going to skip one number. I must let the man who's running my tapes for me. We're going to skip one number. We're doing Sharm el Sheikh. Now, Sharm el Sheikh was written during the Six Day War at the Battle of Sharm el Sheikh. And when I came there, I came there to play for the troops. And a special service officer said to me that this song had been written by an Israeli soldier in Rafi Gabay what I learned it and played for the troops. And my first chance was at a, an Egyptian air base called El Arish. And there were about 2,000 soldiers and about 200 tanks. General Rabin was there. And I played Sharm el Sheikh. And the applause was fantastic. I had to play it again. And in fact, they made me play it six times. And I said, my friends, I can never convey to you the tremendous thrill you've given me by the way you receive what is in effect your number but there are other artists who have come down to the sun I to entertain you. I don't want to hold up the show, please. Don't ask me to play Sharm el Sheikh again. An Israeli soldier called out, you'll play it till you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> now that isn't quite as bad as what happened in uh, Korea. I, I told this at the, um, at, at the, uh, what was it? The interview. I, I want to hear that again too. And that was when they, in, in Seoul, they asked me if I would go out to a trench about 300 yards out and play for three soldiers. Because they couldn't come in to see the show, they had to be out on duty. So I went out there and I got into the trench and I played for them. And suddenly firing broke out. Now, the only religion that I will confess to is that of orthodox cowardice. <laughs> and I said to the soldiers, I didn't realize we were so close to the enemy. He said, man, that ain't no one. I mean, them guys are music critics. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, here is Sharm El Sheikh. If, if, if you've got the tape set, we can start on that one. <laughs>
to finish with what I think is a fairly unusual arrangement of the Rhapsody in Blue. My brother Jerry is going to play the first half, and then I'm coming in on the second half, accompanied, and I give you my word I am not lying, by George Gershwin. You will see what I mean later. Jerry?
on behalf of SPA, Lifetime Achievement Award, presented to Larry Lawrence Cecil Adler, for entertaining four generations and for, for preserving and advancing the harmonica around the world by raising the status of the mouth organ through his artistic interpretation of classical and popular music, presented September 2nd, 1995. Thank you very much. Thank you. our glasses in honor of our guests, Mr. Jerry Adler, Mr. Larry Adler, the two best harmonica players in the world. <laughs> 